and welcome back to Watchbox Studios and Watches Live on Watchbox Reviews. That's a mouthful, but we're right here for the 31st episode of Watches Live. It's the only show on Watchbox Reviews channel shot out of Watchbox Studios in Philadelphia. Now that we've got that square, let me greet all of our friends joining us from around the world. Our chat is live and our watches are many. Uh, tonight we're going to start with Audemars Piguet because quite frankly, I gave you a look at Audemars Piguet beyond the Royal Oak last week. And well, we're going back to basics and back to formula this week, but in a way you've never seen before. I have to admit, I've only seen one of these in the wild. This is the Audemars Piguet. Royal Oak Tourbillon Chronograph reference 25977BA. This is all yellow gold, and keep in mind, this is not an offshore. This is a standard Royal Oak. Now, I do want to give you the benefit of watching this come to life, so I left it unwound and I'm going to wind it so you can see that tourbillon regulator wake up and start beating away at 21,600 vibrations per hour. Now, this is a Renault Papi movement. That's the high-end movement shop that is separate from Audemars Piguet, but linked by corporate lineage. This is where all the high-end stuff is made. You may recognize this watch in that it lived a second life as the Breitling for Bentley Mulliner Tourbillon, but this is it in its undilute original form. Tourbillon carriage, 72-hour manual wind power reserve, solid yellow gold. It is a 44 millimeter case, but that's just the start of it. That's diameter. If you're to actually measure the rigid points from plot to plot, like the inflexible part of the bracelet across the wrist, this is actually a 61 and a half millimeter watch across the wrist. Absolutely sensational. You can see that overcoil hairspring and free sprung balance with a tri-spoke titanium tourbillon cage and a full bridge. I'm going to show you the back of this watch because it's one of the few tourbillon timepieces that actually has a worthwhile case back to share. So this is caliber, if we can get close now, 2889, integrated column wheel, lateral clutch, tourbillon chronograph, manual wind. This one bears all for your enjoyment, and you can even see the recentering hammers acting on the heart cams at center. Truly gorgeous, beautifully finished, Almost 300 parts and 25 jewels. This is Valet de Joux watchmaking at its absolute finest. It is a column wheel lateral clutch chronograph. And a, well, no, let's get close, super close if you can. And a tourbillon. I couldn't wear this thing with a straight face, but this is somebody's summer fun watch for 2018. All right, guys, we had a bit of a latency issue starting the stream. Let me know, are you seeing this? Is there any lag? We had a little bit of a connection thing, but I think right now the stream health is high. Welcome, Eddie Landsberg, Matt Foster, Don Gizel from Germany, Edward Ledden from Sweden, Charlie Mouse, Tom P, Alexi Samola from Finland. Welcome, guys. Welcome aboard, Mark Lisenby, and thank you all for joining me. Okay, so we're going to stick with the AP theme for a moment. That watch right there is over the top, and i got to show you what that looks like next to a traditional 42-millimeter offshore. The offshore gets shouldered right off the screen as the titanium offshore at 42 is absolutely dwarfed by this chronograph tourbillon at 44. So let's put this unwearably huge monster down. Someone will love it. Someone with a, a bomber wrist. Schwarzenegger, I know you're in the market. You're still with AP. Give me a call. Right now, we're going to talk about a titanium 42 millimeter offshore from the early 2000s, late E series. This is a titanium 25721 Ti. So it's 42 millimeters with a gorgeous combination, mega top piecery and lacquer dial with applied white gold numerals, fully luminescent. This is one of the just right Goldilocks AP offshores because it's thin enough with the old school JLC movement that it's just over 14 millimeters thick. And in titanium, it's both hypoallergenic and light enough to wear on a broad range of wrists. So I'm actually going to give you a wrist shot because we've got these watches of various sizes. You guys mostly know my wrist from the watch reviews. So let's do some quick wrist shots and modeling. All right, first we're going to go with the 25721, the 42 millimeter titanium offshore. Now I do like the offshore on a bracelet because to me, it's one thing to exaggerate the form of the original Gerald Genta watch, but the offshore on a strap does lose some of the coherence of the original, whereas the offshore on a bracelet is really a living link to the original, albeit of a more modern sensibility. You get more handcraft with a hand-finished Audemars Piguet bracelet rather than a simple strap. And of course, you have the same level of finishing, beveling, satin, and polish on the bracelet. 
Very comfortable, I have to say. This is a surprisingly wearable watch on my smallish wrist. This is the one to own, by the way. If you've got a small wrist, you're gonna want this watch. You're gonna wanna wear it on the diver strap or the titanium bracelet, because it gets a bit unwieldy on the, the thicker, tougher hornback alligator. And on anything but the titanium bracelet is just gonna overpower a smaller wrist. Wrist 16 centimeters for reference. A lovely piece, water resistant, shock resistant, and here's the other thing. Because of the thin profile of the JLC base in these older offshores, they have an inner anti-magnetic cage that had to be discarded with the later thicker in-house calibers. So it's even a little bit anti-magnetic too. Okay, bump a bump. Eddie Landsberg, what are some fun watch things to do while in London? Hmm. I would say, I hear on New Bond Street there are a bunch of cool watch dealers, so check them out. I would also say, anywhere you may be, and this is a wonderful world traveler's watch, this watch will remind you of your appointments. Now this is from my favorite brand, JLC, a monstrous reference made during the mid-2000s. You can see the watch has a very 2000s character about it. Big, deep, thick, and complicated. It's a 43 millimeter rose gold. This is the second generation Grand Revai. The first was made from roughly 1989 to about 1996. This watch right here features a unique distinction between an alarm that vibrates and an alarm that rings. You can actually choose depending on the level of discretion you require. Now, of course, having teased it, I have to demonstrate it. This being an alarm watch, there's only one way to do that. Okay, we're gonna hear vibrate first. Now we're gonna hear ring. Okay, that's just too much fun. So the bottom line is that this watch is big, it's bold, it's not an aquatic watch. When I talk about summer fun watches, I mean this is the kind of watch to wear by the pool, not in the pool. On the Sunset Strip, Miami Beach, the French or Italian Riviera, this is the look. And I'm gonna put this one on my wrist because it is big, there's no doubt. This size watch makes a statement. Now, if it makes the statement that you happen to like, big, complicated, boisterous, and insistent, this could be the perfect watch for you. It's not particularly water resistant at 50 meters, but I have another JLC option for that. For travel, for fun, for appointments, reminders, or just for thrilling your friends with complication that's accessible and easy to understand, this is an awesome watch to enjoy. And it is a bit of an all-arounder as the case form is shared with JLC sports watches. So while it is a dress watch in water resistance terms, it does look the part of a sporty timepiece. Okay, so for those of you who want something both more discreet and more aquatic, this is the ticket. Now back in 2011, we saw the first tribute to Deep Sea. Shortly thereafter, we saw the Deep Sea Alarm joined by the Deep Sea Chronograph family, and this was probably the best of the lot. This is a what-if watch, as the original 1959 Deep Sea Diving Alarm, you can see the image of the diver from the original in the case back, but that watch was not a chronograph, nor was any chronograph version of the watch made. This was a boutique exclusive, not limited edition, but assuredly limited in production and limited availability. There's a gorgeous simulated vintage patina about the dial, as well as the bezel. It's a non-rotating bezel, and it is a chronograph, vertical clutch, column wheel, 65 hour power reserve. The watch does feature a free sprung balance, so it's got to measure a shock resistance. And unlike the watch we just saw, I'm gonna avail myself of my Govberg polishing cloth. Thank you, parent firm. You can see the watch does have 100 meters water resistant rating to it. So the timepiece does have plenty of aquatic potential. This is a tropic style strap in the fashion of the original rubber, but make no mistake, this particular strap is embossed leather. It's part of the modern trend of embossed leather straps that look like something else. This one's designed to look like rubber. It feels like leather. You're gonna wanna swap it out for a true rubber or a period correct NATO strap, which would look swell on this watch. This is an awesome timepiece that wears far more naturally on a human sized wrist. At 40.5 millimeters, you can see this one wears well, it looks the part, it's convincing, and yet you don't have the delicacy issues that you would get on a true vintage watch. Okay. Now, uh, 
Alex is asking me, Alex W is asking me, can it legally be called a diver's watch without a rotating bezel? That's not called a diver's watch, and no, it can't. There is an ISO norm. It's called the ISO 6425. It's been around since 1996, and it defines what a dive watch is. There are many criteria, but the basic stuff is it's got to be equipped with some sort of constant operation indicator. It's got to be in excess of 100 meters water resistant. It has to uh, have a unidirectional or non-reversible timing device of some kind on it, hence like the common unidirectional bezel. But from an era before we had proper modern dive bezels on our divers, this is what a dive watch was round about 1970. So you're looking at what is really a legend and an exceptionally clean example. This is a Rolex Submariner 1680. It's what's known as a Red Submariner 4th Series. And you can see what makes it a 4th Series. If you could get really close to the dial, and I'll get close as possible. This was the first of the feet first dials, but if you can see the slashes of the F and the T, on the 4th Series, they were not aligned. On the fifth series, they were aligned. And then on the sixth series, you would have had them aligned, you would have had feet first, and then you would have had closed six. The sixes are very subtly open. The, the little curly cue doesn't close all the way on a fourth series. Now you can also see that Submariner seems almost surreal. It's so vivid, it's almost like it's backlit. And that's because for the fourth series, as well as the second series, the red was actually printed on top of a white base. And if you get really close to this dial, you can see that there's a little bit of white ink running out from underneath the printed Submariner. They're effectively superimposed, but old style dials do tell all tales. Uh, you'll note that the radium, or I should say tritium patina, because we're way past radium by 1971, but the tritium patina is beautifully even across the hands, as well as across the indices. It does have a replacement bezel, and as I alluded earlier, it is a bi-directional rotating bezel. A wonderful piece that looks the part. I mean, it is identical to the platonic image of dive watch in every person's mind. Even if it doesn't meet the 1996 ISO, this is what we think of in our head and our heart when we imagine a dive watch. This one with a serial number in the 2.8 million range. This is what's known as a fourth series Red Submariner, a lovely piece. Uh, this one's past its days as a diver. I would not get that watch wet. It's on a beautiful Jubilee bracelet, by the way. This Jubilee bracelet, if you want to take a quick look, is an unconventional accessory to a sub, but it's a good looking one. And since this watch isn't going to get wet, it might be the most apropos. A beautiful five link design. This one's actually stamped the fourth quarter of 1970. So it's period correct to this sub. Jeff Mendelssohn's asking 3135 movement. Oh no, not four hertz here. That's that's a 19,008. That's a slow beat old 1500 series in there. All right. So I would say bump bump bump. bump Edward Ledden saying nice chrono, but the ultimate chronograph for me is the Patek Philippe 5370P. Oh, okay, so we're comparing that to I assume the Royal Oak or or the the JLC. Uh, Okay, 5370P Patek Philippe, enamel dial, Breguet numeral, split second, order only, on approval from the Stearns themselves. I don't think those watches are necessarily going toe-to-toe -to -toe with this. As much as I love JLC, we're talking a different echelon of horology. And why not? Let's talk paddock. We've got it on the table tonight. This is one of my favorite paddock perpetuals, and it's one of the least conventional. The 5159 was the continuation in 2007 of the 5059's bizarre combo of an officer's profile, a perpetual calendar, and a retrograde date. Is it quirky? Hell yeah. Do I love it? Absolutely. So what makes an officer's watch? Well, a couple of features. First, you can see that the lugs have the appearance of having been simply welded on straight with, with screws fixing the strap on, and almost a uh, a hunchbacked, bubble-like case canister that seems stubby in its aspect ratio, unsuited to a wristwatch. And the reason for that is because the officer's watch profile, almost cobbled together from parts, is a look that originated during trench warfare in World War I. Taking a pocket watch, welding on lugs, and then fixing the straps with screws was the way that watchmakers and field suppliers 
ingeniously converted pocket watches, which had to be held, to wrist watches, which could be read while donning a gas mask, operating a firearm, or motioning over the din of the battle to your comrades. So the officer's watch look should look a little bit cobbled together, a little bit botched, as the British would say. One other feature that was common to the type was the Hunter case back, because so many pocket watches featured this design. The Patek Philippe officer's watches, both time and date, as well as perpetual calendars, feature the Hunter case back. So if you want to customize, you have the option of doing it on the interior of the case back. And, and I love this, it doesn't short you the gold or the platinum. So if you get a Patek Philippe Hunter case back, you get the precious metal of the solid case back, as well as the convenience and the pleasure of viewing the movement for which you've paid a great deal. This is also an uncommon central rotor uh, Patek perpetual calendar. Most of them are the micro rotor caliber 240 or a 240 base. It's basically this and the 5320. A handsome watch and at 38 millimeters, very traditionally sized. This watch is not nearly as big as it looks at first glance. And it was actually sized up from the 5059, which was a 36, but that's a 38 right there. Okay. So now here's a question from Eddie Landsberg. What are some good entry-level high horology pieces that won't draw too much unwanted attention? Independent maker if possible. It can be vintage or pre-owned. Well, I have great news for you. If you go with any white metal, Geneva seal, L.U. Chopard, you're going to be a happy man. I would actually go back and look at the original 1860 from 1996, get the caliber 196 micro rotor with the Geneva Hallmark, or get one of the later double signed Geneva Hallmark Calité Fleurier. I would even say if you could find one of the Quattro regulators with the nine day power reserve and the four mainspring barrels with the second time zone and both a chronometer certification and Geneva seal from 2003, get that watch in a white metal and you're set. Or look at Parmigiani Fleurier, where you'll have many options. I would say you can't go wrong with a Tonda 1950 micro rotor. Even better with the blue meteorite dial. You can get the watch and steal new for around $10,000, and that is a true high horology movement. Ten grand black dial steel case will not draw a lot of attention, but impeccable pedigree. Also, don't forget right now the Patek Philippe Neptune, for whatever reason, is so uncool that you can pick them up for pennies. Compared to a steel 5711, you could have a steel Neptune with salmon dial and pick it up for under 15 grand. And for me, that is the way to go. I would also say it's important to remember that there are a lot of brands off the beaten path that offer a tremendous amount of value. Pascal Coyon of France is absolutely high horology with finishing to match. He'll sell you a chronometer, hand finished and handmade, based in France, uh, built in France, based on a 6497, about as good as it gets. So don't rule out small makers like Pascal Coyon or Keaton Myrick of the United States. I would also say if you're willing to wait and you're willing to pay, Aaron Beche is a great choice and absolutely under the radar. Okay. Tim, if you could buy any steel Rolex made today, what would it be? I'm going to say Milgauss Z Blue. Current production, steel Rolex. Yeah, that's what I'd pick. My other tastes kind of trend towards white gold or platinum. So steel Rolex, Milgauss Z Blue, and no regrets. And no anonymity either. Okay. And I can see... I can see High End Rising is saying, owning a perpetual calendar watch would be like buying a dog. All of a sudden, I'd be responsible for keeping it fed and walked. I will say this, though. The watch can go places the dog can't. Now who's man's best friend? All right, moving on. We've got more fun on the table. Let's jump across the border to where they speak German, and they make beautiful things. So this is the archetype of German watch in the 21st century. 38 millimeter, well, 38.5 millimeter, Longa One in yellow gold. This is pretty much as good as it gets. If you're going to own a one and only from each brand, as much as I love the Zeitwerk and its technical ambition and the virtuosity of the finishing and engineering of the datagraph, if you're going to own a monument from each brand. You're going to get your Rolex Sub or Daytona, your Speedmaster Professional from Omega. You're going to get your 
Navitimer, rotating bezel slide rule Navitimer from Breitling, and you're going to pick up some sort of Nautilus, Calatrava, or Royal Oak along the way, but you're going to buy this from Longa. Three-day power reserve, manual winding, twin barrel, you can see gorgeous German silver three-quarter style plate. Now, what German silver is, it's not silver at all. It's nickel, copper, zinc. It's an untreated alloy. We were just looking at Patek Philippe, and we'll bring back a Swiss brass movement with rhodium-plated bridges. This is Panerai. You can see what a Swiss movement looks like, because despite the Italian nomenclature, Officine Panerai is as Swiss as Neuchâtel cheese. So now let's take a look at the German timepiece. Forgive my friends, Philadelphia's finest outside. This is a city. Now you can see it's a beautiful gold that will become darker and more intense with time. There's no plating. What you're actually seeing is the copper in the alloy. It's extremely corrosion resistant, but it will change over time. It will patina without tarnishing. You can also see that the three-quarter style bridge pays tribute to Saxon pocket watches of the 19th century and early 20th century. You can see the jewels of the train, as well as the mainspring barrels, set in chaton that are held in place with heat-blued cobalt blue screws. It's a medley of gold and silver and blue and violet. Now, why a chaton as opposed to a pressed jewel setting? Because this is how it was done in the pocket watch days when manufacturing tolerances weren't as precise. You'd create a rough pilot for the chaton, then you'd put the jewel in the more finely machined chaton and set the chaton in the plate, fixing it with a screw. You'd remove them just as easily for maintenance. And you can see that every balance cock on every longa is freehand engraved, no two exactly alike, a work of art on both sides, yellow gold, and quite frankly, a little bit of a golden tinge on both sides, the kind of watch you wish you could wear upside down. We have more from longa, but let's go back to that Panerai. Now this is an episode that is all about summer fun for 2018, and I don't think it can do much better than the PAM 605. Technically, this is the Panerai Luminor 1953 Days Firenze Boutique PAM 605. Now, this is a 2014 special series of 99 pieces created for the Florence Boutique, which is the true original Officine Panerai watchmaking school, retail shop, and repair center from the 1860s. Now that boutique sold these watches back then with a glorious slate sunburst style, a very delicately treated ecru coloration simulated patina sandwich profile whereby you have a stencil over a fully loomed disc. That's why the dial has that three-dimensional stance over the loomed base. Rose gold hands at center, of course, the namesake, Firenze, of the brand right there. They have always been Panerai of Florence, even after they moved to Neuchâtel. A steel case with the 1950 profile, a little bit more true to history than the older Betterini case. But you'll also note plexiglass crystal for that vintage style distortion. As I move this one off axis, you get the look of a 1950s Panerai 6152 combat watch, complete with the device protecting the crown and the thermoplastic cap. Simple time only, it's what's called the Basse dial. So you have the two-hand look that is iconic of the brand. This one is luxurious, and with a manufacturer movement and three-day power reserve, it's also a luxury watch in every sense. This one's a long way from the ETA tree from which Panerai fell. And of course, if you are a traveler and Florence isn't necessarily your permanent, home base, you have this time zone function so you can jump between zones as you travel without actually stopping the watch. You can see the watch is still running throughout. And because this is a summer watch theme, and this is one that should absolutely get wet, throw it on a Panerai rubber strap or a NATO, and this one's 100 meters water resistant. But where did we come from? Well, we're not going back to the old 6152 of the 50s, but we are going back to 2002 and the 1950, or as it's known among Paneristi, the Fitty. This was the first 1950 case. A limited series from 2002. You can see the genesis of that PAM 605 we just saw. Now they do beat you over the head with it, the 1950 script at 6 o'clock, and with the marina dial that is the small second, it's either either a take it or a leave it for most. Some love the purity of the two-hand Basse dial, some prefer to have constant seconds. I know our old founder and head honcho, O.J. Watley, a Panerai collector par excellence, always preferred to have a little bit of extra complication with automatic winding, small seconds, and he generally liked to have a date. But this one's close to the base. 
with the Marina dial and a gorgeous Panerai ETA caliber on the back, but make no mistake, because it has that small seconds hand, it was able to earn a chronometer certification. Despite being mechanically identical, the 6497 base Panerai without the seconds hand can't get the chronometer certificate. This one's got it. It's got a big slow beating balance at three hertz. It's got a 56 hour power reserve heavily modded. If you've ever seen a PAM 318 and the caliber OP29, you know what a basic 6497 looks like. This is beautifully finished if machine executed, and it does have a sense of occasion about it. The 1950 or the 50, gorgeous on both sides, still a cult watch in the year 2018 and still 100 meters water resistant, so that one's also an aquatic watch. Now let's go crazy. Okay, let's say you're not really gonna get wet, but you want a watch that's got a summer sensibility about it, something that's big and brash, something that's downright Darth Vader in its aesthetic. All right, I got the watch for you. De Bethune DB28 Matte Black. What's going on here? Well, you've got a zirconium case, you have ceramized aluminum, spring-loaded mobile lugs, you have a wonderful hand-finished Twin barrel, six day power reserve, manufacture movement. This is the 2115. You can see it has a radial style power reserve on the case back, as well as a no secrets kept power reserve mechanism. Gorgeous micro perlage and macro perlage, two different sizes on the case back. Flip it over one more time, and you can see that gorgeous delta shaped barrel bridge with the barrels poking out underneath. The funny thing is, the watch is beating and you can't see it because if we can get super close here, You'll note the balance is of Dave Bethune's own design. I'm gonna wind this one back up so you can see just how stealth it is, but give me a moment and I'm gonna show you why this watch might be the coolest two-hand moon phase you're gonna to see today. Okay, so it is a two-hand moon phase. Let's take a quick look at the geography of this extraordinary dial. Now, as the watch beats away, you'll note that the balance wheel is truly a wheel. It's a solid annular mass made of blue silicon at center with a white gold rim to have the largest possible moment of inertia. Now, you'll also note that the hairspring looks a little bit off-centered and bent out of shape. That's calculated because De Bethune makes both its own solid wheel balance, there are no spokes, and its own hairspring, giving you the shock resistance of a flat hairspring that can't get tangled on itself like an overcoil can, but it also has the quality of an overcoil of beating concentrically, so its mass is centered thanks to that crazy terminal curve, and it actually keeps good time in every position like an overcoil. I promised you a moon phase, and here it is, right at the base of the dial. It's a 360 degree spherical moon phase made of a combination of blued steel and palladium. That is about as cool as it gets. You'll also note beautifully oxidized titanium hour indices and then a silver chapter ring inboard, gorgeous delta style hybrid breguet hands as well as linear Cote de Genève perfectly aligned across bridges and plates. One more thing to note, triple parachute, triple shock protection system, shock protection on both sides of the balance bridge as well as Inca block at center. This may not be an aquatic watch, but it is definitely a sports watch. Fully ceramized zirconium case, you have the scratch resistance to wear this one with abandon. And although it is a 43 millimeter case, I'm gonna throw it on the wrist and show you what De Bethune's spring-loaded modular lugs look like. You can actually have them adjust the lugs, giving you the short or the long lugs. These are actually the short lugs for a smaller wrist. So though 43, this one fits with consummate ergonomic ease, and it is incredibly light being a combination of ceramized aluminum and zirconium, it's effectively a second skin, big, black, and bold. This is my favorite watch on the table tonight. That said, it's not the most revealing watch on the table tonight, and in the realm of visible balance wheels, there is one model and one model line that stands above the rest. Before 2005, Breguet was the Marine and Breguet was the Type 20 family of pilots' watches. But in 2005, La Tradition gave Breguet a modern identity, finally breaking away from its old sports watches and the quite difficult to bear mantle of its famous progenitor. Breguet created a look for the brand in the 21st century that simply stole the show at Basel 2005. 
This is the Breguet La Tradition 7027 BB. White gold, gorgeous, frosted bridges, a pocket watch for the wrist, a completely inverted caliber. This is the caliber 507 DR, and as you can see, it leaves nothing to the imagination. At center, the mainspring barrel, and then you have the train leading to a free sprung balance with a beautiful overcoil hairspring. You can also see a parachute system. De Bethune took a lot of the design language from Breguet as well as the engineering principles, because you can see, if we can get super close, the De Bethune features a triple parachute shock protection system on both sides of its balance. The Breguet features a parachute as invented by Abraham Louis Breguet, a complicated macro spring-based shock protection system on its balance. They both feature visible open movements with dial-side balance structures. The Breguet effectively paved the path for De Bethune, a rare case of a large luxury group actually setting the pace. You want more? You've got it. You've got the set, well, you've got the barrel, you've got the great wheel, the third wheel, the fourth wheel, the escape wheel, the balance wheel, which is a wonderful aerodynamic style recessed nut free sprung structure, and then you have a solid gold rose lathe cut guilloche main dial. You have a stealth power reserve sitting right next to it, tracing the 50 plus hour power reserve of the movement, and then you turn it over, and it's just as spectacular on the case back. Instead of seeing the balance and the escapement as well as the powertrain, you see the actual mechanism that undergirds the power reserve display. And when you wind it, you can see it move in real time. This is a watch that lays everything on the table, bearing its mechanical heart and soul to its owner. This is about as much fun as it gets. Two-sided power reserve scales, an entirely open caliber, and an incredibly wearable case size of just over 38 millimeters. If you take this one home, you're not going swimming, you're not going spelunking, you're not going cliff diving, you're not going mountain biking, and you're gonna have to watch the X Games from the grandstands, but you know what? This might be the most fun you can have with a luxury watch for summer 2018. Breguet, the first and the last name in watches, I'm giving you the final word. Thank you everyone who joined me tonight. I really appreciate the commentary in the chat box. I always read all the comments after the episode, so if I didn't acknowledge you, I'm still grateful. I'm still going to read your comments. Thank you so much. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. New watches posted daily, and we've got a full suite of 2018 Rolex coming online later this week. So subscribe to Watchbox Reviews. Check me out at Tim underscore Masa on Instagram. Thank you to the crew. Thank you to you. Time out. Tim out, and thanks for logging on. Mm -hmm.